Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and we're once again celebrating 10 years on YouTube. As of January 4th, it has been 10 years on YouTube in 2021. Tonight's story is one that I think I've definitely redone probably two, maybe three times. Um, but I've redone it a few times because it is special to me. I polled on Twitter to see what you guys thought were classic Creepypasta stories. And I will admit that a lot of the ones that will show up on this list are taken from that poll. However, the Russian sleep experiment, and honestly, I could say probably cupcakes, um, are two stories that stick out quite a bit because these are my first real deep dives into shock and gory horror when it comes down to being Mr. Creepypasta. Like, I mean, I've seen Saw and Hostel and everything like that in movie theaters, but trying to act out those parts here was different. And honestly, it was challenging in a in a very new and different way. So, in a lot of ways, the Russian sleep experiment really kind of stuck with me over that amount of time because of just how dark and blood-soaked and gory it really gets. And I think in a lot of ways, it kind of stuck with all of you for that same reason. Thinking that maybe something so gut-tearing and bloody could actually have existed, or actually could have happened. Who knows? Either way, this is one of the ones you all definitely said was a classic creepypasta story, and if it helped make all of you, then it certainly helped make me. This is The Russian Sleep Experiment, by an unknown anonymous author. Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept five people awake for 15 days using an experimental gas-based stimulant. They were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor their oxygen intake so the gas didn't kill them, since it was toxic. This was before closed-circuit cameras, so they only had microphones and five-inch thick glass portal-sized windows into the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was stocked with books, cots to sleep on, but no bedding, running water and a toilet, and enough dried food to last all five for over a month. The test subjects were political prisoners deemed enemies of the state during World War II. Everything was fine for the first five days. The subjects hardly complained, having been promised falsely that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. Their conversations and activities were monitored, and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic incidents in their past, and their general tone of their conversations took on a darker aspect after the four-day mark. After five days, they started to complain about the circumstances and events that led them to where they were, and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other, and began alternately whispering into the microphones and the one-way mirrored portals. Oddly, they all seemed to think that they could win the trust of the experimenters by turning over their comrades, the other subjects in captivity with them. At first, the researchers suspected this was an effect of the gas itself. After nine days, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber, repeatedly yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. He continued attempting to scream, but was only able to produce occasional squeaks. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about this behavior is how the other captives reacted to it. Or, rather, didn't react to it. They continued whispering to the microphones until the second of the captives started to scream. The two non-screaming captives took the books apart, smeared page after page with their own feces, and pasted them calmly over the glass portals. The screaming promptly stopped. So did the whispering in the microphones. After three more days passed, the researchers checked the microphones hourly to make sure they were working, since they thought it impossible that no sound could be coming from the five people inside. The oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that all five must still be alive. In fact, it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume at a very heavy level of strenuous exercise. On the morning of the 14th day, the researchers did something that they said they would not do to get a reaction from the captives. 
they used the intercom inside the chamber, hoping to provoke any response from the captives that they were afraid were either dead or vegetables. They announced, We are opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor, or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you your immediate freedom. To their surprise, they heard a single phrase in a calm voice response. We no longer wished to be freed. Debate broke out amongst the researchers and the military forces funding the research. Unable to provoke any more response using the intercom, it was finally decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed to the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air and immediately voices from the microphones began to object. Three different voices began begging, as if pleading for the life of loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was open and soldiers sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever. And so did the soldiers when they saw what was inside. Four of the five subjects were still alive, although no one could rightly call the state that any of them were in life. The food rations past day five had not been so much as touched. There were chunks of meat from the dead test subjects' thighs and chest stuffed into the drain in the center of the chamber, blocking the drain and allowing four inches of water to accumulate on the floor. Precisely how much of the water on the floor was actually blood was never determined. All four surviving test subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not with teeth as the researchers initially thought. Closer examinations of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most of it, if not all of it, was self-inflicted. The abdominal organs below the ribcage of all four test subjects had been removed, while the heart, lungs, and diaphragm remain in place. The skin and most of the muscles around the ribs had been ripped off, exposing the lungs through the ribcage. All the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four could be seen to be working, digesting food. It quickly became apparent that what they were digesting was their own flesh that had been ripped off and eaten over the course of a day. Most of the soldiers were Russian special operatives at the facility, but still many refused to return to the chamber to remove for the test subjects. They continued to scream to be left in the chamber and alternately begged and demanded that the gas be turned back on, lest they fall asleep. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out. Another was gravely injured by having his testicles ripped off and an artery in his leg severed by one of the subject's teeth. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives, if you count ones that committed suicide, in the weeks following the incident. In the struggles, one of the four living subjects had his spleen ruptured, and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him, but this proved impossible. He was injected with more than ten times the human dose of morphine, and still fought like a cornered animal, breaking the ribs and arms of one doctor. When his heart was seen to beat for a full two minutes after he had bled out, to the point there was more air in his vascular system than blood. Even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flail for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone in reach and just repeat the words more, over and over, weaker and weaker, until he finally fell silent. The surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility. The two with intact vocal cords continuously begged for the gas, demanding it to be kept awake. The most injured of the three was taken to the only surgical operating room the facility had. In the process of preparing the subject to have his organs placed back within his body, it was found that he was effectively immune to the sedatives that they gave him to prepare him for the surgery. He fought furiously against his restraints when the anesthetic gas was brought out to put him under. 
who managed to tear most of the way through the four-inch wide leather strap on his wrist, even through the weight of a 200-pound soldier holding that wrist as well. It took only a little more anesthetic than normal to put him under, and the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject that died on the operating table, it was found that his blood had triple the normal level of oxygen. His muscles, that were still attached to his skeleton, were badly torn, and he had broken nine bones in his struggle to not be subdued. Most of them were from the force his own muscles had exerted on them. The second survivor had been the first of the group of five to start screaming. His vocal cords destroyed. He was unable to beg or object to surgery and he only reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproval when the anesthetic gas was brought near to him. He shook his head yes when someone suggested, reluctantly, that they try the surgery without anesthetic, and did not react for the entire six-hour procedure of replacing his abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. The surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that it should not be medically possible for the patient to still be alive. One terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile several times whenever his eyes met hers. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of drastic importance, the surgeon had a pen and pad fetched so the patient could write his message. It was simple. Keep cutting. The other two subjects were given the same surgery, both without anesthetic as well. Although they had been injected with a paralytic for the duration of the operation, the surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralyzed, the subject could only follow the attending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short period of time, they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asking for the stimulant gas. The researchers tried asking why they had injured themselves, why they had ripped their own guts, and why they wanted to be given the gas again. Only one response was given. I must remain awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced, and they were placed back into the chamber, awaiting determination as to what should be done with them. The researchers facing the wrath of their military benefactors for having failed the stated goal of their project considered euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer, an ex-KGB, instead saw potential and wanted to see what would happen if they were put back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected, but were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had their restraints padded for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three stopped struggling the moment it was let slip that they were going back on the gas. It was obvious that at this point, all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One of the subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was straining his legs against the leather bonds with all of his might, first his left, then his right that is left again for something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off the pillow and blinking repeatedly. Having been the first to be wired for EEG, most of the researchers were monitoring his brainwaves in surprise. They were normal most of the time, but sometimes flatlined inexplicably. It looked as if he was repeatedly suffering brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on paper scrolling out of the brainwave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyelids slip shut at the same moment his head hit the pillow. His brainwaves immediately changed to that of deep sleep, then flatlined for the last time as his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. His brainwaves showed the same flatlines as the one who had just died from falling asleep. The commander gave the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside, as well as three researchers. One of the named three immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point-blank between the eyes, then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed the gun at the remaining subject, still restrained to a bed as the remaining members of the medical and research team fled the room. 
I won't be locked in here with these things! Not with you! He screamed at the man strapped to the table. What are you? He demanded. I must know! The subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily? The subject asked. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go into the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. The researcher paused, then aimed at the subject's heart, and fired. The EEG flatlined, and the subject weakly choked out. So nearly free. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video or listening to the podcast episode on tonight's podcast episode. You can always find the podcast at Spotify or on Google or wherever you happen to find podcasts. And if you want to hear even more from me, you can always check me out on my audiobooks. If you take a look on Audible, you can listen to Tales from the Gas Stations, Volume 1, 2, and now 3 on Audible, as well as many other audiobooks that I've worked on. And I want to give a very special thank you to all of you who support me on Patreon, because quite honestly, you guys help me keep the lights on in my house. And I can't thank you enough for that. A very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Canon Lando Higuchi, Chumbinski, Bobby Carmen, Nico Kyle, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Deanna Krauss, G. Weevil 3, Chris Lovin, Freddy Krueger, Dr. Stein and Mr. Happy, Miranda Jeffries, Hal Gungshi, Justin Johnson, Raven Hart, Unknown Nobody, Michael Scarborough, Kazen, This Is My Real Name, No Shit, Jason V.B. Wilson, Infernal One, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Someone You Love, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much. Like, seriously. Thank you guys so, so much. And if you would like to be able to join them, you always can at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. I love you guys. Seriously. All of you who support on Patreon, who follow, who subscribe, those of you who listen, and those of you who lurk, Thank you for the amazing 10 years and sweet dreams. <laughs>